Hello, I am Miss Janet, and today's lesson is Lesson 5 in the Life of Elijah. We're going to start with a song, You Are a Wonderful God. We truly have a wonderful, loving, Heavenly Father who watches over and takes care of us. Our scripture is from 1 Kings chapters 18 through 21 and 2 Kings chapters 2 and chapters 9. Remember who a true prophet was. He was someone who spoke for Almighty God. There were false prophets of idols in those days and we still have false teachers today. Because our Bible was not finished, prophets were needed to give the people new information from God. If what a prophet said was going to happen didn't happen, it was the death penalty. One had to be absolutely accurate when one spoke for God. The prophets could also preach, explain the instructions God had previously given to his people. We don't need prophets today because we have the completed Word of God, the Bible. But we do have preachers and teachers who explain to us what God has already said in his Word. Although Elijah isn't the main prophet in today's lesson, his prophecy concerning the destruction of King Ahab and his line of descendants comes true in the smallest sad detail in today's lesson. In our last lesson, after Elijah told Ahab he would die and all his boy children and boy grandchildren would be killed, Ahab repented and God said the judgment wouldn't happen in Ahab's lifetime. Three years later, Ahab was back to his old ways. This was God's description of King Ahab, 1 Kings 21 verse 25. There was none who sold himself to do what was evil in the sight of the Lord like Ahab, whom Jezebel his wife incited. Incited is encouraged or egged on. We'll use the term the person incited to a riot. It's uh, incited is always used in a bad way. Good King Jehoshaphat of Judah decided to make friends with the country to the north, Israel. Since the people of both countries were from the same ancestors, he thought they should be closer. However, King Ahab were, and Israel worshipped idols, and King Jehoshaphat and the country of Judah worshipped the one true God. Jehoshaphat had been king of Judah for 17 years and should have had more wisdom by now, but he didn't. King Ahab hated God's word and his true prophets, like Elijah and Micaiah, who we meet in today's story, but King Jehoshaphat loved God and tried to follow his words. Our memory verse is 2 Corinthians 6, 14. Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness, or what fellowship has light with darkness? A yoke is an ancient device used to connect two animals together so they could use their combined strength to pull a plow, a wagon, turn a grinding wheel, or whatever needed to be done. 
it only made sense to use two animals of the same kind and size. I found this picture of a camel and a burro on the internet. For some poor guy, this may be all that he had, but I don't think it worked very well. The same would be for an oxen and a donkey. They're not the same size or weight, it just doesn't work well. When Paul wrote 2 Corinthians 6.14, he was talking about commitments people make, business partnerships, marriage commitments, as well as your friends. Who one goes to war with is also very important, as we discover in today's lesson. It doesn't go well when a believer and follower of God joins with someone who doesn't believe in or follow the Lord God. 2 Kings 22 For three years Syria and Israel continued without war, but in the third year, that was since Elijah's prediction of Ahab's death, Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, came down to the king of Israel. It could have been at this time that the two kings arranged a marriage between Ahab and Jezebel's daughter, Athaliah, and Jehoshaphat's son, Jehoram. She turned out to be evil, just like her parents. And when her husband, the king of Judah, died, and then her son, Ahaziah, she tried to murder all of the remaining sons and grandsons so she could be queen of Judah. God spared one son, Joash, who later became king of Judah. Verse 3, And the king of Israel said to his servants, Do you know that Ramoth Gilead belongs to us, and we keep quiet and do not take it out of the hand of the king of Syria? And he turned to Jehoshaphat, sitting next to him, and said, Will you go with me to battle at Ramoth Gilead? And Jehoshaphat said to the king of Israel, I am as you are, my people as your people, my horses as your horses. Ramoth Gilead was a city that originally belonged to Israel, but Ben-Hadad had captured it and not given it back when God had given Ahab a victory over Ben-Hadad and the Syrian army. Jehoshaphat's army could have been much larger than Ahab's. It was at least as big, so it was a big help to Ahab to have Jehoshaphat and his army. And Jehoshaphat said to the king of Israel, uh, Inquire first for the word of the Lord. It is always a good idea to ask God for wisdom and help when you have an important decision to make. But truthfully, we should ask him for wisdom each day. Jehoshaphat had no business going to war with an evil man like King Ahab, who worshipped idols and murdered his own people. What does our memory verse say? 2 Corinthians 6.14 Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers, for what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness, or what fellowship has light with darkness? Verse 6 Then the king of Israel gathered the prophets together, about 400 men, and said to them, Shall I go to battle against Ramoth Gilead, or shall I refrain? Death's not go. And they said, Go up, for the Lord will give it into the hand of the king. But Jehoshaphat said, Is there not here another prophet of the Lord whom we may inquire? These prophets claimed to be prophets for the one true God, but something just didn't seem right. They were just trying to make King Ahab happy to get stuff from him. King Jehoshaphat had heard enough true prophets in his own country that what these men were saying just didn't sound right. There are false teachers today who are working for Satan. If we spend time in God's word, he will help us recognize these false teachers who are not speaking the truth about God. Wisely, King Jehoshaphat asked for a second opinion, a real prophet of the Lord God. Verse 8, And the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, There is yet one man by whom we may inquire of the Lord, Micaiah, the son of Amala. But I hate him. For he never prophesies good concerning me, but evil. And Jehoshaphat said, Let not the king say so. Jehoshaphat's response was very weak. Ahab's statement should have been a real warning that something was very wrong. Verse 9. Then the king of Israel summoned an officer and said, Bring quickly Micaiah of Amala. Now, the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, were sitting on their thrones, arrayed in their robes, at the threshing floor at the entrance of the gate of Samaria. 
and all the prophets were prophesying before them. Important business was conducted at the city gate in those days. It was the center of commerce because people would be entering in the city with their things to sell or such. Verse 11, And Zedekiah the son of Chanana made for himself horns of iron and said, Thus saith the Lord, With these you shall push the Syrians until they are destroyed. And all the prophets prophesied so, and said, Go up to Ramoth Gilead and triumph. The Lord will give it into the hand of the king. These four hundred false prophets were putting on quite a show for the two kings. Verse 13, And the messenger who went to summon Micaiah said to him, Behold, the words of the prophet with one accord are favorable to the king. Let your word be like the word of one of them, and speak favorably. But Micaiah said, as the Lord lives, what the Lord says to me, that will I speak. The messenger said, everybody was telling Ahab to go to war and he would win. Micaiah should join the crowd. Micaiah was a true prophet of God and would only speak what God told him to say. Going with the crowd is often the wrong thing to do. Verse 15, And when he had come to the king, the king said to him, Micaiah, shall we go to Ramoth Gilead to battle, or shall we refrain, that is, not go? And Micaiah answered him, Go up in triumph, the Lord will give it into the hand of the king. But the king said to him, How many times shall I make you swear that you speak to me nothing but the truth in the name of the Lord? Swear is taking an oath that you are telling the truth, like one does in court in this case. It was obvious to King Ahab that the prophet Micaiah was speaking sarcastically or in a way that clearly said he didn't mean what he was saying. Ahab wanted to know the truth, but he didn't want to obey it. Knowing God's will is not enough. We have to obey it. Verse 17, And Micaiah said, I saw all Israel scattered on the mountains as sheep that have no shepherd. And the Lord said, These have no master. Let each return to his home in peace. No master meant no king. He was saying that the king would be killed and the people of Israel scattered. Verse 18. And the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, Did I not tell you that he would not prophesy good concerning me but evil? Micaiah then told a make-believe story to try and get Ahab's attention. In it, God asks how Ahab can be persuaded to attack Ramoth Gilead and die as predicted by God through Elijah the prophet. The winning answer is for the false prophets to tell Ahab it is safe for him to go to battle and he will win. Micaiah finished the story with verse 23. Now therefore behold, the Lord has put a lying spirit in the mouth of all these your prophets. The Lord has declared disaster for you. Almighty God doesn't need to anyone to help him figure out what to do. He knows everything. It was just a story. God's mercy for Ahab and his sin had come to an end. It was time for judgment. Some people think that they will live their lives as they wish and then come to Jesus before they die so they get to go to heaven. But we never know when we're going to die. People die in accidents every day. Verse 24. Then Zedekiah, the son of Chanana, came near and struck Micaiah on his cheek and said, How did the Spirit of the Lord go from me to speak to you? And Micaiah said, Behold, you shall see on that day when you go into an inner chamber to hide yourself. That would be when the king was defeated and all his prophets were running for shelter. And the king of Israel said, Seize Micaiah and take him back to the governor of the city and said, Thus saith the king, Put this fellow in prison and feed him meager, that's small, rations of bread and water until I come in peace. And Micaiah said, If you return in peace, the Lord has not spoken by me. And he said, Hear all you people. Micaiah wanted the people gathered there to remember God's words. King Jehoshaphat still foolishly agreed to go to battle with King Ahab. He didn't want to embarrass himself by refusing to go, but it almost cost Jehoshaphat his life. Verse 29, So the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, went up to Ramoth Gilead. And the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, I will disguise myself and go into battle, but you wear your robes. 
King Ahab thought a change of clothes could protect him from the judgment of Almighty God? I don't think so. He was making Jehoshaphat the victim, or fall guy as we sometimes say. Verse 31. Now the king of Syria had commanded the 32 captains of his chariots, fight with neither small nor great, but only with the king of Israel. And when the captains of the chariots saw Jehoshaphat, they said, It is surely the king of Israel. So they turned to fight against him. And Jehoshaphat cried out. And when the captains of the chariots saw that it was not the king of Israel, they turned back from following him. God graciously saved Jehoshaphat from his reckless, foolish actions in agreeing to fight with King Ahab. Once Ben-Hadad's soldiers realized it wasn't King Ahab, they left King Jehoshaphat alone as he was not their target. Verse 34, But a certain man drew his bow at random, meaning he put an arrow in his bow and he pulled it back and he let it go. There is nothing random in the plan of Almighty God. He plans down to the smallest detail. The scripture goes on, And struck the king of Israel between the scale armor and the breastplate with the arrow. Therefore he said to the driver of his chariot, Turn around and carry me out of the battle, for I am wounded. And the battle continued that day, and the king was propped up in his chariot facing the Syrians. The king was propped up in his chariot, so it looked as if he was still directing the battle. His presence kept the soldiers fighting. And scripture goes on. Until at evening he died, and the blood of the wound flowed into the bottom of the chariot. And about sunset a cry went through the army, Every man to his city, and every man to his country. Those were the exact words of the prophet Micaiah had said in his prediction. Verse 37. So the king died and was brought to Samaria. And they buried the king in Samaria, and they washed the chariot by the pool of Samaria, and the dogs licked up his blood according to the word of the Lord that he has spoken. What God says comes true. King Ahab's death was God's judgment for his sin. Galatians 6, 7, do not be deceived. God is not mocked, for whatever one sows, that will he also reap. Sowing is planting like seeds, and reaping means to harvest, the results of planting the seed. If you follow God's way and do what is right, God will bless you. If you do what is wrong, you will eventually pay the price, either in this life or after you die. Verse 40, So Ahab slept with his fathers, that is, died and was buried, and Ahaziah his son reigned in his place. But listen, to how the Bible describes King Ahaziah. He did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and walked in the way of his father and in the way of his mother. He served Baal and worshiped him and provoked the Lord God of Israel to anger in every way that his father had done. What a terrible description of a life. Not only did Ahab suffer for his sin, but he taught his son to do the same. And two years later, we pick up the story. The story continues in 2 Kings 1. Now Ahaziah fell through the lattice in his upper chamber in Samaria and lay sick. It would be rather unusual for an adult to fall through the shutters of a second story window. Maybe he was drunk. I don't know. Scripture goes on. So he sent messengers telling them, Go inquire of Baal Zebub, the god of Ekron, whether I shall recover from this sickness. But the angel of the Lord said to Elijah the Tishbite, Arise, go up to meet the messengers of the king of Samaria. Elijah did as God instructed. He met these messengers on their way and gave the Lord's message to them. The messengers returned to the king and he said to them, Why have you returned? And they said to him, There came a man to meet us and said to us, Go back to the king who sent you and say to him, Thus says the Lord, Is it because there is no God in Israel that you are sending to inquire of Baal Zebub, the god of Ekron? Therefore you shall not come down from the bed to which you have gone up, but you shall surely die. The king said to them, What kind of man was he who came to meet you and told you these things? They answered him, He wore a garment of hair and a belt of leather about his waist. And he said, It is Elijah the Tishbite. 
The artist draws Elijah looking quite neat and fancy. He was dressed more like a mountain man, a rough and tumble outdoors man. He was also fairly old by this time. When it says a garment of hair, it would be like goat's hair or camel's hair, uh, animal hair that was woven. The king sent soldiers to kill Elijah, who was sitting on the top of a hill. There is a saying, if you don't like the message, kill the messenger. Maybe King Ahaziah thought if he killed Elijah, he wouldn't die from his injuries. God destroyed the first two groups of soldiers the king sent. God knew the hearts of these men. He never would have destroyed innocent men. These were wicked men. There was a man sent with the third group, and he, verse 14, fell on his knees before Elijah and entreated, that's begged, him, O man of God, please let my life and the life of these fifty servants of yours be precious in your sight. This was a righteous man, so God did not destroy him. Verse 15, Then the angel of the Lord said to Elijah, Go down with him, do not be afraid. So he arose and went down with him to the king and said to him, Thus says the Lord, Because you have sent messengers to inquire of Baal-zebub, the god of Ekron, is it because there is no God in Inzeral to inquire of his word? Therefore, you shall not come down from the bed to which you have gone up, but you shall surely die. Verse 17, So he died according to the word of the Lord that Elijah had spoken. Jehoram became king in his place because Ahaziah had no son. Jehoram was another son of King Ahab. Twelve years later, King Jehoram and all of the sons of King Ahab were killed when a man called Jehu took over the kingdom of Israel. He was known for being a fast, wild chariot driver. Queen Jezebel was thrown from a second-story window and died. We're now in 2 Kings 9.33. And some of her blood spattered on the wall and on the horses, and they trampled on her. Then he, Jehu, went in and ate and drank. But he said, See now! To this cursed woman and bury her, for she is a king's daughter. But when they went to bury her, they found no more of her than the skull and the feet and the palms of her hands. When they came back and told him, he said, This is the word of the Lord which he spoke by the servant Elijah the Tishbite. In the territory of Jezreel, the dog shall eat the flesh of Jezebel, and the corpse of Jezebel shall be as dung on the face of the field in the territory of Jezreel, so that no one can say, This is Jezebel. She was all evidence of that she had ever existed was basically wiped off the face of the earth. This is a terrible price to pay for continual, constant sin in the face of God. Galatians 6 7 Do not be deceived, God is not mocked, for whatever one sows or plants, that will he also reap. Ahab and Jezebel received the punishment from God for their evil deeds. Sin separates us from God and from everything good. You may think, I have never done anything as bad as killing people like Ahab and Jezebel, but the Bible tells us in Romans 3.12, no one does good, not even one. Romans 3.23 for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Ahab and Jezebel did so many terrible sins, we can't count them. But God's standard is absolute perfection. We all sin. We can't meet God's standard. Romans 6.23 tells us the result of our sin. For the wages of sin is death. Now comes the good news. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Death is separation. Separation from God and His wonderful home called heaven forever. Our sin had to be paid for. So Jesus paid for our sin when He died on the cross to pay the penalty or the cost of our sin. To prove He was God and had paid for our sin, He came back to life three days later. We celebrate that at Easter. Now we must tell Jesus we accept his free gift, just like you accept any gift. In this case, you reach out with your mind rather than your hands and accept it. Ask Jesus to forgive your sins and send his Holy Spirit to live with you. 
Salvation is free to us, but it cost the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, his life. Let's close in prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for this story that reminds us there is a price to pay for sin, but you paid the price for our sin if we will accept you as our Savior. And if there's a someone who has never done it today, they can pray, Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for loving me. Thank you for dying on the cross to pay the penalty for my sin and coming back to life to prove you had done it. I ask you now to come into my life with your Holy Spirit and lead and guide me. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Until next time, when we will have the last lesson on the life of Elijah, have a great week and may God richly bless you. If you would subscribe to our videos, it will be easier for you to find us all of them. Please click on the thumbs up if you like the video. We have a list of their stories and their web addresses, so it is easy to simply copy and paste the address in your browser to immediately get the story. Email us at Bible Stories by Ann and Janet at gmail.com. Goodbye.